Sun Bhattan, we are here at Spinnaker Summit in San Diego and today we have with us Isaac Mosquera, you are CTO of Arbory. First of all, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Uh, before we started recording this interview, we were talking about Spinnaker, its evolution, you know, and um, it started at Netflix to solve their own problem, but yeah. now it has evolved into a big project that is being hosted at, uh, at a neutral foundation. Yes. It has so many users that are coming to it. So if you look at Spinnaker today, what is it? Is it just a CICD tool or is it a platform? What is it? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So it did start as a CD tool at Netflix to solve a very specific problem. And as the tool evolved at Netflix, um, over a period of time when Google got involved and Microsoft got involved uh, and more of these cloud providers got involved, <clears throat> And definitely evolved into a platform. And what a platform means to me is that it gives you a base uh, level of functionality, but allows you to extend it and to build on top of it. And so for, for uh, a history of time, we used to go, well, here's our build tools and here's our CD tools and they sit side by side. Spinnaker, on the other hand, actually sits on top of our entire SDLC tooling and integrates with the entire lifecycle. So you have a view end to end on how packages and your software gets into production. Armory has been involved with the Spinnaker. I think you are a kind of pure play Spinnaker company, if yes. I'm not wrong, uh, from the very early uh, days. And yes. as the project is growing, a lot of new use cases are coming in, a lot of new users are coming in. Are you concerned that those users' use cases might uh, bloat Spinnaker? Uh, you guys might lose focus on what you originally planned to do with it? How do you ensure that while you enable users to come in, you don't lose focus? Yeah, um, again, another great question. So there's, there's two parts to this. Um, the first part is that the community has a lot of kind of evol uh, values, uh, cultural values that really extend from how Google and Netflix operate at mega scale in the cloud or cloud technology. And those are really embodied inside of Spinnaker and embodied inside of the community. And so that helps guide the community on what features we're going to build, what features we'll accept into Spinnaker, um, how we will build it. So there's a lot to do with just where Spinnaker was born that helps us maintain uh, those, those values and those show up in Spinnaker as a product. The second part of that though is that we also want to make sure that Spinnaker is extendable and extensible. That anybody who wants to add something for their particular needs can do so and can do it outside of the core Spinnaker project. So if something you want to do with core Spinnaker doesn't align with our values, but you still need to get it done, you can use our plugin framework or run job framework, uh, web hooks to integrate with that other system to do what you want to do, but it doesn't affect the rest of the community. Um, but it's a great way of just getting your work done. Also, when, when you look at these you know, open source projects, what happens is that you know, either you can build yourself or you buy it from a vendor. With open source, typically what happens is that, okay, it's day one thing, but what happens to day two? Yeah. Plus, uh, sometime, you know, uh, when you bring in an open source project, you have to integrate with your, maybe just billing system, you know, maybe a lot of other things. And those are not features and functionality that the larger open source community needs. That's where vendors come in, you know, they just bake everything together so you can just take the project, turn key solution and work on it. So, so vendors play a very role, critical role. So what I want to understand from you, for a project like Spinnaker, they're like companies like Google and Netflix who created the project. Then they are open source users and then there are players like Armory. What is the role of players like Armory for the ecosystem, yes. survival and sustenance? Yeah, um, so again, another two-part answer. So the, the very first part is we are the voice of our customers. Um, and if you like at Netflix, it, they're building Spinnaker just for Netflix. They have one customer themselves. Google also um, is in the community uh, and building for customers for GCP in particular, right? That's their highest priority, Google Cloud. Armory, on the other hand, uh, is really ushering in customers from any cloud, whether that's Amazon, Google, Azure, AliCloud. We are 
taking that feedback from all of our customers and helping direct the open source roadmap, right? So for example, plug, the plugin framework was something that we really wanted to work on because it allowed us to extend Spinnaker without needing to affect the core project. And because we we're always extending Spinnaker to do something for our customers, we felt like it was a great way to have Spinnaker not only be extensible for anybody, but also help us uh, build features and products faster without really affecting the core and having to go back to Google and Netflix and, and the, the technical oversight committee for big changes that we wanted to make. So that's the first part. Uh, the second part is we do build proprietary integrations that are just uh, for Armory customers. And those proprietary integrations are things that many large enterprises need. Because if you look at Netflix and Google and the way that they use Spinnaker internally, they actually have extended it to be their pl platform uh, for software delivery as well. But they have a lot of internal tools. For example, uh, uh, Netflix has a monitoring solution called Atlas. They have their own security tools that are uh, closed source. They have their own provisioning tools that are closed source. Uh, uh, a few, um, uh, the canarying system started as closed source. And so Spinnaker inside of uh, Netflix integrates with a lot of closed source systems. Outside of Netflix, anybody who adopts Spinnaker is using things like uh, Terraform using things like JFrog, right? And those tools are part of the software delivery lifecycle and we build integrations to plug into those because otherwise, while Spinnaker would provide some value, you're not really getting 100% of the value if you're not integrating with all the tools in the tool chain. When we look at, you know, all these projects, JFrog, and, um, I mean, companies mix and match whatever they need yeah. for their work. Uh, now, Spinnaker is also part of Continuous Delivery Foundation, if I'm not wrong, and it has other projects also, Jenkins and all those things. Um, how helpful it is for Spinnaker to be part of Neutral Foundation, where it might also create opportunity for, for companies like Netflix to open source a lot of their other components, which they might see more value in putting into open source, uh, but now they have a neutral home, they have a governance model where they don't have to worry about how to open source it, who to get involved. So what role do you think you know, it, it plays to have a neutral home for these projects? Yeah, well, I will say that the Spinnaker project is a, a unique one. Uh, most projects, if you take something like Jenkins, there is a commercial entity that created it and is uh, commercializing that. And you, can, you see that with Terraform, they have HashiCorp. Docker, they had Docker, the parent company. Uh, Cassandra had um, data stacks, right? But then you have Kubernetes. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, well, Kubernetes is still kind of created by Google, and they um, they were the commercial entity. So the difference between those uh, projects and Spinnaker is that Netflix created Spinnaker, but was never going to monetize it. Unlike Google, unlike data stacks, unlike Docker. So putting it into a neutral home for them, I think, is a really kind of brave move um, because you're giving up a lot of control to this other entity of a core project of your business, right? It, it runs everything inside of Netflix. And again, that's different than uh, Kubernetes. That wasn't run inside of Google for any internal services or, or data stacks and Cassandra. And that was a really brave move. To be honest, I think we're still seeing how that plays out for, for Netflix. Uh, on the other hand, for the community, I think it's a really good thing because it puts it into this neutral home. It says that we as the community are going to make the best decisions for that project um, and that we are going to try to push the community forward. And that may or may not be at odds with, with the things that Netflix needs. Um, time will tell, I guess. When you work with your customers, uh, and I was talking to uh, DRDO before that, yeah, yeah. Uh, that customers are really critical to Armory, you know, that's what you care about. More. What are the, some of the key pain points that your customer is still face where you are like, you know, the speaker still has to solve those problems? Yeah, um, well, there's a ton. So <laughs> the, the first two that really come to mind, the first one is operating Spinnaker is still rather challenging, right? There's a lot of value on the other side of getting, once you have Spinnaker up and running, but getting it up and running and getting it operationalized still takes a bit of work. 
we, Armory, along with Google, are working hard this year to come up with a set of solutions that allow you to run Spinnaker inside of Kubernetes seamlessly. We call it uh, Kubernetes native for, for Spinnaker. Um, the, the second challenge, which I think is actually a more difficult challenge uh, that I think most companies face is that there are cultural changes, changes that are happening inside of these organizations. And in order for you to take advantage of Spinnaker and all of its goodness, you do have to change the way that you think and work about engineering and building product. You do need to think about things like service ownership and autonomy and trust and really trusting your developers and giving them information to make decisions instead of keeping that information and also making decisions for them. It's about pushing things to the edges. Um, pushing things to ICs because they're the ones who really know. And when you do that, actually, things start to work a lot faster and better. And Spinnaker is built on this premise, and it will help you, you and your organizations change. Um, but that is a long road, to be honest, uh, to help companies change their, their culture. But Spinnaker, I believe, is the best way of doing that. I think Kubernetes is another great way of, uh, another great tool of really allowing developers or empowering developers to make decisions, um, own their services, um, be autonomous. And uh, that's probably the longer, bigger challenge for us. Yeah, after talking to some of the customers, uh, what I uh, noticed was that most of them are either using Kubernetes and plan to use Spinnaker, got to help them, or, or some are using Spinnaker and plan to use Kubernetes. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, just the way in old days, it was a lab stack. Yeah. Today, it looks like it's going to be, you know, Kubernetes, Spinnaker, and all those other things. Yeah. So uh, how do you look at it that uh, both Kubernetes and Spinnaker are part of Linux Foundation projects, CNCF and CDF? Yeah. Uh, uh, do you have any plans for Kubernetes also, or you will just remain purely? How how will you enable customers to leverage these those technologies? Yeah. Uh, so, the way that we're looking at it today is that Spinnaker sits not only on top of Kubernetes, uh, but also on top of uh, you know Amazon and Google, their VMs and and functions. The the thing about Kubernetes is something that is is a phenomenon that is really taking over and. The way that we're thinking about it is that everything needs to be Kubernetes first in the community. We have to make sure that that experience is the best experience you have um, for software delivery and Spinnaker is bringing that to you. And so this means that we will probably continue to move more of our interfaces into Kubernetes. So have CRDs for all of the objects inside of Spinnaker so that people who are very familiar with Kubernetes can easily get started. And over a period of time, I think we'll have more and more integration points um, with Kubernetes. For the most part, like we are a great choice to deploy into, into Kubernetes today. It's more of the operations of Spinnaker and how does that integrate with the Kubernetes ecosystem that we're still iterating on. And again, with, with Google and with Netflix, who are, we're all incentivized to really make it work really, really well with Kubernetes. One thing that is common between both Kubernetes and Spinnaker is both are hard to, you know, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. So making them easier because as the ecosystem grows, as more and more, because right now I think most of the advanced users are embracing it, but sooner or later a lot of other companies will yeah. also start using it. Yeah. So, so what do you think about, uh, or to rephrase the question, what do you see the, I mean, we cannot talk about five years from now. Yeah, we we'll can talk about it. Next year, like 2020, yeah. how, what is the roadmap of Spinnaker look like? What, what are the immediate problems that you are trying to solve as a community? Yeah, so there are really two to three constituents that we think about. Uh, the first one is the operator, the person who has to administrate uh, Spinnaker and get it up and running and make sure that it's operationally available, highly available. And Kubernetes provides you a lot of those constructs, but in order for our, uh, uh, you know, our constituents in the community to be able to take advantage of this, we have to build the right uh, integrations into Kubernetes so that allows them to operate easily. So there's a, um, we, we do have an operator for Spinnaker uh, that runs natively in Kubernetes and it helps you maintain that Kubernetes interface. The other, uh, you know, the, the other uh, persona that we, we work for is uh, the developer persona. What they need is things like visibility into what's happening inside of their Kubernetes clusters and 
we work with some customers that have seven to 800 Kubernetes clusters. So you can imagine having to manage all of that, vis visualizing all of that is really, really challenging and not having Spinnaker as a UI is, is, um, would be really hard. So we, we need to work not only to continue to visualize everything really well, there's some things that we need to improve, but also what does it look like to take your application from a VM onto Kubernetes using Spinnaker. And I believe we have an opportunity to prevent a whole set of uh, class of errors before you even deploy, right? We can set you up with pipelines that will work from like, as soon as you push start, it'll actually get it into production because we, we know where the most failures are when you do deployments. We know if it's gonna fail before it even gets into production. And so those two are our main uh, personas that we work with. The third one that we're starting to see now is the, the security persona. And um, uh, it's a term now called uh, DevSecOps. So that's starting to kind of come up. And when you think about DevSecOps and its automation, really it's just kind of, for us, it's another integration point into Spinnaker, into this platform to actually pull in all the security, security components and uh, data and metadata into Spinnaker so that we can make decisions on it. So we're starting to work with um, those people through what we have is a, is a policy engine to allow certain people to perform certain actions or have access to certain resources or to stop a pipeline uh, before it gets started because the container wasn't um, verified in the last week. And all of those um, constructs around the policy engine will really be focused around like the Kubernetes ecosystem, data that lives inside of Kubernetes and how do we uh, integrate with Kubernetes and uh, apply our policies on top of that so that you have the seamless Kubernetes experience using Spinnaker. Thank you, Isaac, for, for talking about all these, you know, the nitty gritty of, you know, Spinnaker, Absolutely. especially, you know, to understand those problems that, you know, the community is still, like, because people mostly like to talk about the good stuff, you know, yeah. but there are some real challenges also. Yeah. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you again next year when the Spinnaker Summit and the Spinnaker both will be much bigger than what they are today. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me.